Uh, it's a great honor to, to have you, uh, for me, to be here today as the director of IMT and to have you, Gene Stanley, and to, awa to award him uh, an honorary doctorate in economics. Uh, it is impossible for me to summarize uh, and, to, and to account for his career. This is a slide we prepared, uh, you know, that uh, you see from, from the slide uh, that Gene Stanley has published more than 1,100 peer review articles, who received about uh, 55,000 citations. His uh, H index is uh, 114. He supervised, uh, he supervised about uh, 94, 93, I don't know the exact number, he will tell us, PhD thesis. So his contribution to physics, to science, uh, I think we can summarize it with those indicators and with those numbers. But who knows uh, Gene Stanley? knows that it is impossible to summarize the contribution he gave to science and to our lives, uh, many of us, uh, all over the world, in different fields, ranging from biomedicine to economics to physics, uh, because of his generosity, because of uh, what he did for young scientists and uh, for science in many ways. His achievements in academic leadership include the Massachusetts Professor of the Year in 1992, the Boltzmann Medal, the National Science Foundation Distinguished Teacher Scholar Prize in 2001. He is an, an elected member of the National Academy of Sciences of the United States uh, since 2004. His book, Introduction to Phase Transitions and Critical Phenomena, published by Cambridge University Press in 1971, received an incredible number of citations and still uh, the sales of the book demonstrate and certificate the impact that the book had and is having on, on science. And then he co-authored uh, 27 additional books. One important contribution, and it, this is one of the publications that then testify uh, his contribution to economics, is the book that he published together with Rosario Man Mantegna, again for Cambridge University Press, which has been translated in five different languages which is Introduction to Econophysics. Jean uh, has always taken on humanitarian issues with colleagues, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Sergei Buldirev, reminds to me every time what Sergei did for him and for science during his visits in Soviet Union uh, starting from the 70s, I think. Uh, and then uh, is also involved on issues related to gender equality in science, for which he was awarded the American Physical Society Nicholson Medal in 2003. Uh, I want to I don't want to summarize what Gene Stanley did in order to establish a bridge, a connection, an interaction between physics and economics. You can go back to the former slide. Uh, but I want to focus on a few points. Uh, and there is a division of labor we agreed on. That is to say, I'll focus on some, and I'll try to give you some insights and some hints on his contribution 
in the economic analysis uh, and in the analysis of the real economic systems, I would say, the real economy, starting from uh, the empirical and the theoretical work he did together with co-authors uh, in the analysis of business firms' growth and in the analysis of instability in economic systems. Uh, I discovered for the first time the work of Professor Stanley by reading uh, a paper that, uh, that was published in Nature in the year 1996. And the paper was a paper focusing and showing what at that time seemed to me a striking uh, fact, a striking fact, violating some of the assumptions uh, of economic theory before that paper. And the paper was on the relationship, basically it was on two, and the paper raised the attention of the economic community on two different facts. First of all, the relationship between the variance of the rate of growth, the rates of growth of economic entities, in that particular paper of business firms, and the sides of those entities. There is, a, there was a benchmark, which is the so-called Gibral law of proportional effect, that is, which implies that the relationship between the rate of growth of an economic entity and the mean sides of that, of that economic entity uh, is independent, so the rate of growth is independent from the sides. According to that hypothesis, uh, the prediction in terms of the relationship between the variance of growth rates uh, and different size classes uh, was violated, in fact, uh, by the power law that was found in the, in, the, in the Nature paper, which was showing a non-trivial relationship between uh, the standard deviation of the rates of growth and the size of an economic entity, with important implications uh, in the analysis of economic instability, in the analysis of the impact of size and diversification on volatility and instability in, in real systems. The second empirical evidence that was produced in that paper was on the shape of the growth rate distribution. And this is an important point already because uh, as uh, uh, economists, we were There is a kind of a long tradition in the analysis uh, of the relationship between the mean of a given, or at least in the analysis of the first two moments of a given statistical distribution, not on the analysis of the entire shape of a statistical distribution. And the important point about that shape was, again, a violation emerging from the empirical investigation, from that fact, of some of the uh, mainstream hypotheses that we are assuming that the growth rate distribution was Gaussian. And on the contrary, the paper showed that the, the growth rate distribution was represented by a double exponential distribution, that is, with fat, fatter tails than the one that one would predict according to the, to the, to the mainstream. And this is an important point because the frequency of extreme events was much larger than uh, the, the theory was, was predicting. I'm using a non-technical language because of the fact that uh, within the room there are not only physicists uh, and economists uh, uh, and scientists, but there are also uh, uh, students uh, from, and colleagues from different backgrounds. Those two facts attracted the interest of a few distinguished economists. First of all, Professor John Sutton, who unfortunately cannot be here with us, but he is here with us today for several reasons. John Sutton, professor of economics at the London School of Economics, that then wrote a paper trying to explain the puzzle, trying to account for the puzzles that were emerging from the empirical analysis and, and that, that was published in the Nature paper. And then we started, several economists started, to try to replicate 
those uh, investigations on different data sets and we rediscovered the sum of the exponents that Professor Stanley found in his uh, seminal papers because I'm, I quoted the, the first one but then there, there, there are other papers for example the paper that uh, together with Lee and co-authors uh, they publish on the uh, at a different level of aggregation moving from firms to countries and again finding the very same exponent. Then Professor Sutton decided to organize a session, an entire session, at the Econometric Society on uh, these analysis of uh, the relationship between the sides, the growth, and the variance of the rates of growth of different economic entities. And this is where I met for the first time Professor Stanley, and this is where our collaboration started. Then uh, other contributions came, and Professor Stanley and co-authors came to define a very simple and parsimonious stochastic framework, which accounts for four different regularities in the analysis, uh, in, in, in the analysis of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, the growth of economic systems. First, again, the relationship between the variance of growth rates and sides. Second, the shape of the growth distribution of growth rates, the, of the growth distribution. Third, the shape of the size distribution at different levels of aggregation. Fourth, the relationship between the mean of the rate of growth and the mean of sides. So why, and I'll move to some of the more general issues, uh, why these findings, this approach, this contribution is important? We believe that distinguished economists like Xavier Gabet, John Sutton, and many others believe are, are bringing some fundamental contribution, a, cont a fundamental contribution to the economic analysis. I'll try to summarize from different perspectives. First of all, because when you find regularities in socioeconomic phenomena across different domains and data sets, and you know, as an economist, that those domains and data sets are influenced by different mechanisms. Then if you find the very same exponents, the very same laws at work in those different domains, we do believe that there is a good reason to go stochastic, I will say. That is to say, to, to look for a very simple and general stochastic framework that irrespectively of specific assumptions or assumptions specific to each domain accounts for those regularities. And this is a very important, I would say, epistemological and methodological lessons, lesson for economists. Because sometimes, and, and colleagues uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a kind of an orthodox background will, uh, will excuse me for, for that provocation, sometimes we have very sophisticated and rich, meaning with many parameters, models, economic models, that account for a very specific fact in a very specific domain that cannot be replicated in other, in other domains. So this, this idea is uh, if I find regularities in domains that are so different, then it's better to keep my model the simplest as possible in order to make it powerful and general enough to account for those different variations. So the simplest possible models uh, is the lesson uh, and that's a lesson that came uh, you know, from the heterodoxy in economics, but is in, I, I will see continuity here. This is my obsession. Uh, but I do see a strong continuity between the work you did and the work that was done by Herbert Simon and co-authors uh, uh, many years ago. Second point, 
and I'll try to keep it short. Uh, uh, second point is appropriateness of those simple models. What does that mean? Obviously, the capability of a very parsimonious stochastic framework uh, to replicate the equilibrium distributions that then you observe empirically. Because if the model is simple but wrong, uh, then <laughs> Uh, in, in, in replicating, in accounting for the facts, uh, then we have a problem. Second point, in terms of appropriateness, is the plausibility of the very simple framework and the very simple mechanisms that we put at work as explanatory mechanisms uh, within, within the models and across the different domains. And this is another important point because uh, one of the first meetings we had to write uh, the first paper, we had an interesting discussion because I told, him, I told Professor Stanley, now this is a stylized fact. And then he told me, what is a stylized fact? We only know real facts. If a fact is a fact, then you need to be able to replicate the fact in different data sets with independent observations. And if you find that those findings are at work uh, in different domains, then you have a law which is made of real facts. If the fact is too stylized, then there is a good probability it is not a fact, it's an artifact, which is introduced in order to justify sound mathematical assumptions that then make the life of those we need to write the models easier. So this is another important point. A third important point is that uh, coming back to the violations of the theory on the analysis of business firm growth, there was an assumption underlying uh, the perfect world in which you have many Gaussian distributions that we used until the mid-90s under the Gibra hypothesis. That is to say, you have a very nice uh, and treatable Gaussian distribution and then the facts that happen to be outside the distribution are outliers. So the theory should not account for those extreme events but because the, the extreme events are simple exceptions that you, know, you, do, you as an economist do not need to take into account. For example, there is a, 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 an analogy between what you did and what has been done in the analysis of earthquakes. Because if I think of, for example, of the Gutenberg-Richter statistical formula, which accounts for the, the distribution, the probability density function of the intensity of earthquakes, then you see that if you plot the frequency of those events over a double logarithmic, on a double logarithmic scale, you find a, a straight line and you see that you don't have outliers because all the facts, all the, the intensities are along the straight line. And this is the demonstration of the fact that you have a model, a statistical formula, which accounts also for the extreme events. And this is the notion of power laws that then uh, has been influencing the analysis of economic instability. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, a very important paper, two very important papers that uh, Xavier Gabé published uh, on the quarterly journal economics on the annual review of economics, exactly talking and, 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 and showing how if you have uh, fluctuations at the micro level because of the presence of those extreme events, uh, then those fluctuations propagate at higher level of aggregation within the economy. And uh, the micro level instability within an economic system affect the maps onto the macroeconomic instability within that system. So we are not talking about exoteric fact. We are talking about uh, concrete uh, representations of the economic uh, life and economic systems uh, that simply were not seen as part of something that should have been explained by the theory. They were outside the theory, they were outliers. So the idea that you don't have facts that are necessarily outliers, but that 
your theory might be wrong came to my mind thanks to the <laughs> thank to the and i think this is an important simple but the fundamental contribution of the interplay between statistical physics and economics so let's understand the big ones let's understand the, the rare events let's take into account those fluctuations within the theory you have and i think you'll elaborate uh, during your presentation on finance i'll stop here with a few remarks uh, which are somehow the challenges i think and which are part of the ongoing research in this field first of all we we know that uh, like in a craftsmanship i would say the appropriateness is the tricky is a tricky thing because when you have uh, distributional models which are general enough you have the problem of conditioning upon condi unconditional objects that is to say the log normal distribution for example or the pareto distribution can be generated by many alternative stochastic processes and if you want to condition upon then you go back to the appropriateness issues that I was uh, that I was uh, that I was raising before another point is that what kind of theories are we talking about I'm a very simple minded person and I think that there is a methodological implication for the work the work that you started for us as social scientists and as a, which is the use of theories as uh, approximations successive approximations of reality because obviously when you start with a very simple model you will always uh, find uh, a statistical test which violates to some extent the predictions of the model but it is not because of the violations that you should dismiss the model on the contrary it is good if the model is simple enough to consider the violation to as like a second approximation that is to say to account for deviations from from the from the original model and to explain the new facts with some integration of the original so the idea is to use the simple framework the simple stochastic frameworks like benchmarks for more elaborated uh, 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 economic investigations and again it's important to be aware of uh, what and which facts need really additional structure of the theory and on the contrary what and which facts are already explained by a given then there is another point that we are trying to 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 work on uh, we have uh, uh, here for example massimo riccaboni who's worked intensively on that uh, which is the uh, kind of how to introduce more rigorous uh, statistical testing of some of the predictions uh, that are generated by those simple stochastic frameworks being aware of the fact that it's always difficult it's always possible to find a key square which falsifies a given model, a given statistical model. So if uh, you have enough data. So there is a, an intrinsic problem there of uh, establishing a rigorous uh, test on, on uh, subtle differences among different distributional uh, models. But there is also, but it's also important to develop statistical theories and statistical models that allow us to tell whether some data fit a particular extreme hypothesis or another one it's a challenge is not is i would say it's the frontier and at the same time i do see it uh, with some caveats but it's for sure the interplay between empirical and econometric investigation statistical testing and the analysis of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, produced by statistical physics is extremely important. And finally, there is another uh, issue which are trying to, to explore here, uh, also thanks to the present with, with presence within the faculty of a diverse set of competencies ranging from pure mathematics to 
to statistical physics with, uh, with Alberto Bempora, the Rocco De Nicola and, and Guido Caldarelli. That is to say, and Irene Grimaldi, that is to say, the relationship between parsimonious stochastic frameworks and uh, topological representations of complex systems with discrete methods that, uh, that can be used an as an explorative device in order to detect uh, some of the properties uh, that uh, then uh, uh, run uh, the evolution of complex uh, uh, stochastic processes. Uh, I promised to be short, and so I already falsified, uh, 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 I already contradicted myself. Uh, but now, if you, uh, I don't know if, if you can bring me the, because now it's time, before is uh, Lectio Doctoralis, for me to, oh my God. to <laughs> <laughs> award <laughs> Professor Stanley, for uh, his contribution to science, his leadership within the community of statistical physics and economics, his role as a groundbreaker in the emerging interdisciplinary science of econophysics, uh, and upon the recommendation of the executive and academic councils of IMT, and by uh, the authority of the Ministry of Education of the Italian government, I confer upon you the degree of philosoph or doctor of philosophy honoris causa in economics, markets, and institutions. So it's a really a great honor. Thank and you. Uh, and thank, uh, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I. I open it. So open it. Oh, again? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, not no, finito. Not finito. Uh, so you cannot imagine how I'm honored because that was my last <coughs> formal act as the director of the institute, and so. I could not uh, hope to have a better chance uh, to conclude my mandate as the director with this, uh, with this great honor. I now invite Professor Stanley to give his Lectio Doctoralis entitled The New Science of Econophysics. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm very deeply touched to see this audience. I might point out to those who are standing, I counted nine empty seats, and there may be more if people leave during the talk. So why should you be standing? Uh, please sit down. There are seats scattered at random. I hate to see somebody stand. It's not worth standing for this talk, I can assure you. <laughs> may not even be worth sitting. So before I begin, I'd like to make a dedication of this talk uh, to uh, the director, and now ex-director, of EMT, to the staff of EMT, to the students of EMT, and to the faculty. I think that this dedication, unlike many others, is for not only doing good work, but creating something out of nothing. For me, this is the great accomplishment. I went to a fancy graduate school. And every time the uh, uh, alumni gather, the president said, our goal is to keep Harvard number one. How boring. And, and now I'm in a university that was, really was awful. And it's still pretty awful in some things, but it's very good in others. And when we have meetings, our main message is we have to figure out how to make Boston University the best. And there's a totally different attitude. And what Fabio Pamoli and all the people that have come here to work with him share in common is a vision <coughs> that education in Italy, in fact, in the entire world, can be much better than it is. And I really commend you for that. It's not easy. Not to mention the physical facilities, which I've witnessed since you first came here, and 
the uh, enthusiasm of the students and the facts that everyone knows that students here are treated equally regardless of the country they come from, the language they speak, and so forth. So congratulations. So now I have about 20 minutes left to share a few thoughts with you. And I think, to be honest, Fabio did a better job than I'm doing. So if you're getting a little tired, <coughs> there's a nice time to let your eyes slowly go down and have a little 20 minute rest. So the overall guiding question, and a good talk has a, opened with a question, is can physicists really contribute to economics? And I, I tried to make a, a few little bullet points based on my own experience of, a, 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 of a, a prescription that might enable a physicist to contribute. And this is actually quite different than what many physicists think you do to contribute. The first, in my opinion, is to get a partner in the subject field, in this case economics and finance. And without such a partner, you can not only reinvent the wheel, but you don't even know the terms, you don't know basically anything, and there is no conceivable way you can learn all of economics in a short period of time. People who study economics study it for seven or eight years. And secondly, is to respect data. Not only respect your partner, but respect data. This is already a, a, a deviating point from the activities of many economists who respect theory very highly and data to some degree. But if the data don't agree with theory, we already heard from Fabio uh, the term they use, an outlier. And uh, you could imagine for Newton's law, if uh, suddenly I started to levitate, you wouldn't say, oh, it's just an outlier. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> to have to replace Newton's law. And the second, uh, third point is to always ask the question, what, if anything, are the data telling us? Sometimes data are not telling anything. They're just ra random, scrabbled. But frequently there are messages hidden in data, particularly when one looks at big data. Big data is a modern catchword for basically every data that you can possibly get your hands on. And that number is growing super exponentially, faster than exponential, for reasons we all know. And uh, the fourth point is uh, <coughs> to each finding you find, to try to attach a number to it. For example, I said big data is growing faster than an exponential. But the question we would ask is, well, what is the law? Or is there a law, uh, uh, empirical law? So why do you want to quantify? Because you may be surprised. You may see some connection with something else. And the uh, fifth thing is uh, do not be timid. What really timid means, do not be frightened of the experts in the field who will laugh and laugh, and when they're not laughing, they will criticize in, in worse ways sometimes, not Fabio Pamoli or John Sutton and so forth, but many will. For example, a, a, a thing that physicists uh, often do uh, is to aggregate data, to take all the stocks together, for example, and throw them in a big pot. And instead of a, a few hundred thousand data, you have a few hundred million data. Why would you do that? You're throwing away information. And the answer is if you study the kinds of events that matter to all of us in this room, which are rare events, rare meaning uh, bad things, really bad things that fortunately are rare, then you don't want to be, you, you want to detect that signal. And the way you detect it, of course, is to uh, aggregate the data. Just as in earthquake stations, uh, there is not just one station to study earthquakes, there are stations all over the world. And then the most difficult thing of all is to try to see if there are any connections between various findings. For example, when we study stock fluctuations, we have price fluctuations, which you read about every day in the newspaper. But we also have fluctuations in volume, which are also printed in the newspaper. Volatility, which are not printed but can be ca calculated on your, on your PC. And things that are a little more subtle, like intertrade times. Why would you be interested in things like this? Well, they may give clues, and they may not give clues. But if they're there, if the data are sitting there, why should they just sit? 
And you might think, but my God, economics is a huge field. Surely people as gifted mathematically as economists have analyzed every piece of data they could get their hands on. But there are many reasons why they have not. One is that they're not raised to analyze data. Economics is not, uh, at least the generation that's now in charge, is not raised to handle huge amounts of data, but instead to do theory, make plots sometimes, and try to understand, try to understand, but not to look at data. And when data are needed, this is hard to believe, they hire a, uh, an, an assistant. And when I had a grant, the first grant I got in economics, of course was with a partner, and I looked at his budget, and he had a full-time assistant. And I said, what's that for? And he said, to do the calculations. <laughs> and the, the point is, if someone else does it, the statistics they know is whatever they learned in a book, and they'll never get much beyond least squares fit or, or some other much more complicated thing, but they won't look at things like levy distributions, not to mention power loss, which are not. So the person who should be in charge, in my opinion, of data is the investigator himself or herself. And last, for those who can make a theory, I, I'm not very good at this, but some can, try to make some theory that somehow connects the facts. The smiley face is that, is that uh, you see facts are facts, or even if they're called stylized facts, uh, they're at least facts. Theory is, is only theory, and theories come and go, and almost every theory in physics has, has uh, evolved, shall we say. Some are completely wrong, some are just partially wrong. Even laws have evolved. Newton's laws are no longer valid. We know that under certain conditions that Einstein helped us appreciate. So let's move on. So this is a, a, a brief outline of what I'm going to talk about today, which is something new. I don't like to talk about old things. Uh, first, I forget. It's very uh, embarrassing. And uh, especially talk about old things where uh, two of my collaborators are sitting in this room, Fabio and Massimo Riccoboni, and other former students, such as Alex Peterson, are sitting here. And I, I, I would just embarrass them if I tried to talk about something that was uh, five or ten years old. So I'm going to talk about work by a an uh, equally brilliant graduate student, Alex Peterson, named Tobias Price, who uh, 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 just now was awarded a faculty position at Warwick. Warwick, W-A-R-W-I-C-K, is a leading British university trying to overcome, uh, overtake uh, Cambridge. And, uh, and uh, uh, the question that we're going to ask here is, uh, uh, how can we quantify fluctuations on different time scales. And the range of time scales will consider ranges over nine orders of magnitude, from milliseconds up to, up to months or even years. And, uh, and the key thing that fascinates me is finance is we all care about the average. We want the average growth of a company, of a country or a company to be a, a certain number. The bigger, the better. Everyone has that same ambition. However, if you look in the newspaper, all you see is zigzag curves because the market is co constantly switching from going up to going down and then switching again, going back up. And it won't surprise you that this switching occurs on all time scales. If you examine on the millisecond time scale, you see this switching. And if you examine on the long term time scale of years, you see this switching. 1929 was an example of a very bad switch that took a long time before the market switched back on. And uh, these are my collaborators. Uh, Rosario Mantegna I put first because he was a postdoc in our group, and he is the person, more than anyone, who persuaded me that this finance section of the newspaper had more utility than just using those paper to line my kitten box which is roughly what I did with it, and, and, uh, and got me really interested in this subject. And Shlomo Havel and Sergei Bulderev have worked with me on this from the beginning. You already know I've mentioned Fabio Pamoli, Massimo Riccoboni, Alex Peterson is here, and the young uh, recent graduate is Tobias Price, and a long number of other people, and could be you. I really like uh, to, uh, collaborators, as you probably know. And, uh, and so uh, if anybody gets interested, uh, and I'd like to acknowledge Cambridge University Press, which uh, for most of us in physics is the preeminent publisher of physics books and the editor for the last 30 years of 
Cambridge University Press, Simon Kaplan, came all the way from Cambridge, England, here, uh, and I'm deeply touched by his coming here. Uh, and of course, he came for a reason, because we wanted to discuss a book that's just about finished called uh, Tentative Title, Rise and Fall of Business Firms with these people. Okay. So, bubbles. What, if, what about bubbles? What can we say about bubbles? <clears throat> well, we know they're, they can be very bad. Isaac Newton knew they could be bad. He lost all his money in the South Sea bubble, and he was famous for exclaiming at that time, <clears throat> I understood the laws that govern the, everything on the planet, everything in the, in the solar system, even everything in the universe, but I don't understand economics. And, and, uh, uh, and that's still true. No one really understands economics. And I will take the approach that, that the, the part of the bubbling effect is due to the fact <clears throat> that there are not just one trader in a market, but many traders, and they're strongly interacting with each other, not because they know each other, they usually don't know each other, but they all look at the same computer screen. They see the effects of everything that's going on, more or less instantaneously, and their job is to react to that quickly and not slowly. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, I don't think I need to say more about that. So let's start with something we all recognize. I'll go a little faster on this. This is what you see every day in the newspaper, plots of the price of something against time. This is over 40 years, long period, of a stock average which is a commonly watch of the top 500 firms in the USA. And we all know that it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And here the top curve are the actual empirical facts and the bottom curve is the model that's still used on Wall Street today. It's a simple model that dates back over a century <coughs> to a student of Poincaré in Paris named Bachelier and he said, this looks like a random walk. <clears throat> In fact, to be very precise, there was no random walk then. He, he invented that concept, but he modeled this as a drunken walker who throws a coin, and if its head goes up a notch, and if its tail goes down a notch. And as you see, it does a pretty good job. This is completely honest. The data are honest, and the, and the, and the uh, theory is honest, and that's why it's used at Wall Street. <clears throat> However, if you look closely, excuse me, <clears throat> if you look closely at the data, the red curve, you see events like Black Monday here, where markets everywhere in the world lost approximately 25% of their value. Uh, it doesn't look so big here because it's a log scale. But, uh, and to lose 25%, that means the drunk goes a huge number of steps in the, in the down direction. The probability of this occurring from a random walk is 10 to the power minus 248. So essentially never. Not the lifetime of the universe, but many lifetimes of the universe. So this model, although it's used for convenience, because it's very tractable, it gives uh, functions that mathematicians are, are happy about because you can say something. Uh, 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 even though it, it, it mimics much of the data, it misses the rare events. But of course, it's just the rare events that we're all worried about. So what do we do? Well, what did we say? The first thing you do is take a collaborator. And we took a collaborator named Xavier Gabet, who is now an endowed chair professor at Stern School in New York, and also won uh, uh, two major economics prizes in the last two years. Uh, and what is this? In the same color scheme, in red, are the data, not for the price, but for the change of price, which are called returns. And you see, for example, in 87, this big negative spike, which you may not know, most people don't, is that very shortly thereafter, there was a huge positive spike. And the units are standard deviations. So this positive spike is almost 20 standard deviations, and same for the negative spike and so forth and so on. And contrast, the Gaussian it never fluctuates beyond about five standard deviations, or six, or seven, but never, never 20. Uh, and therefore, this curve looks totally different than this curve. Whereas in the previous slide, like the integral of this, uh, is easily confused for being pretty close to the real thing. Uh, very few people would say this black 
curve uh, resembles this. Now, what, what can these data tell us? And uh, Mandelbrot, uh, may he rest in peace, uh, was one of the pioneers in uh, bringing to uh, uh, economics and finance empirical analysis. And we can, in the spirit of Mandelbrot, ask what did the data tell us? First of all, they, we just said the data show that the, the fluctuations are not Gaussian. This was, of course, known before Mandelbrot even, but, but not appreciated how serious it was. And in fact, the data we'll see in a minute support a power law. And in fact, an inverse cubic power law, which you could see with the eye by simply asking how many events are more than five standard deviations. There are 64 if you count them. How many are more than 10? There's eight. How many more than 20? There's only one, Black Monday. So from the sequence of 64, 8, and 1, each time you, each time you double the x-axis, the standard deviations, you can see that this is an inverse cubic law. You double is 2, and you make less common by a factor of 2 cubed, or 8. Uh, you can see other things that are known qualitatively, that big events cluster, what's called volatility clustering. Again, something that's known uh, qualitatively, uh, but, uh, but not quantified. And uh, uh, that's something that, uh, that uh, both of these things are something that our uh, little group at BU, with all these collaborators I mentioned, has uh, made uh, uh, positive steps in quantifying this. And even more interesting is something that Montaigne did after he left our group with his student, Lilo, who is now right next door in Pisa, uh, and that it was followed up on by Alex Peterson and, and three others, four others, uh, a few years later, is that the, 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 as you can see here, for every shock, there's an aftershock. And the aftershocks sort of fall down gradually. Another shock and an aftershocks. Just like earthquakes have aftershocks. And in fact, there are even aftershocks of each aftershock. So, there's a shock, there's an aftershock. And uh, the aftershock generates more aftershocks. And this sequence is, if you uh, think about it, is a, a suggestive of a power law sort of behavior. And that's exactly what is found. Um, so uh, we've said this already many times, but now instead of using the eyeball, we can actually analyze data. How many data? Well, Gopi Krishnan and Pleru, uh, he's now at Goldman Sachs uh, for their PhD thesis, analyzed uh, every trade of every stock in America. And uh, they, uh, uh, over a period of a year or two, and they had 200,000 data points, that's 200,000 trades, and 1,000 companies makes 200 million, a huge number of data points. And because of that, there's very little fluctuation in these symbols, it's half of the positive tail, half of the negative tail. But the really remarkable thing is the change in frequency of events drops by six orders of magnitude, and it's still, the black symbols are still on this straight line. That means an event that's eight orders of magnitude more rare, because this is a cumulative distribution, eight orders of magnitude more rare is obeying the same law that the everyday events obey. And what does that mean? That means, number one, there must be some fundamental mechanism. We have to find what it is. And secondly, uh, it means that uh, uh, I instead of studying only those rare events, which you have to sit around, thank goodness, you have to sit around for a long time to see, uh, you can study everyday events and almost surely be getting uh, properties that describe the rare events. So that's very fortunate. And I don't need to show you this. Uh, and there are other things. Uh, for example, everyone would wish that the stock prices were correlated, but they're not. This is an, a log linear plot. So the, ex, the straight line connotes exponential decay, and the characteristic time is only four minutes. So there's no correlations in the price. However, if you calculate not the price or returns, but the absolute value of the price, uh, as one measure of volatility, then you find that the data uh, follow not an exponential fall off, but a power law that's approximately straight from something on the order of half a day up to roughly 50 days, over two orders of magnitude, which is remarkable. That means that the big volatility today will still be manifest in data that take place 
uh, 50 days from now. It's in really, it's in, to me, it's incredible. So the data, although looking at this, you would say, well, they're not correlated. But if you look at the absolute value, they're very much correlated. So that means they're not serially independent. Whatever they are, they're not independent. If something happens today and happens again in the future, you would never call this independent. And that's important to know because some people would like to think they are independent. Uh, we can skip there. There's a law that describes volatility also, but, and there's a universality. If we take three totally different places, Paris, London, and New York, and analyze something, this happens to be the, the uh, volume, uh, uh, but almost anything does this. Uh, the data fall in the same, uh, the same uh, uh, straight line with the same slope for all these different countries. So there's a kind of universality. What does that mean? That means it makes one optimistic that whatever it is, and we still don't know, that governs these fluctuations, it's, you, we use the word universal. It sounds pretentious, but it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon that is governing fluctuations in all different places. And one reason the citations are high is that every country in the world has some market. So every, every few months, someone analyzes the fluctuations in their country's market, their favorite country, wherever they are, including countries that have economies that are quite different than Paris, London, and New York. And they find always the same thing, with one exception. Uh, Okay, we could skip this, but for mathematicians, the random matrix theory that was actually first used in physics by Eugene Wigner for a totally different application in nuclear physics turns out to be useful for finding out and quantifying when things are not random. And, and, and I don't think I'll tell you that except to say that when one performs the analysis, one finds Statistical properties are the same for different stocks that are, belong to the same industry sector. So a, a, a man from, or a woman from Mars who landed in America on a, on a flying saucer uh, doesn't know what any of those three little three letter codes mean like IBM and APL and so forth would be able to, by simply looking at the numbers to say, oh, all of those are companies that do uh, computers. And, uh, and, other, and so forth, that the, the economy is broken into sectors and these sectors reflect themselves in very subtle cross correlations between the prices of one stock and another. And how to uncover those cross correlations is a challenge because many things look like they're cross correlated. You know, if, if, if my wife sees me every evening walking on the, on the, on the metro with the same beautiful young woman, and she might say, hey, what's going on? And I, of course, would say that's sheer coincidence, and there's no way to know. But in the stock market case, if two stocks look like they're correlated, it's the same thing. There's no way to know, uh, except this random matrix theory. And this is, I meant to point out, uh, almost everything you hear, uh, even what Fabio was saying, are empirical analyses of data using uh, the tools that a, a child learns in school. In other words, make a histogram, we all learn that. Make a plot of your histogram, we all learn that. Send the paper to nature. And, uh, and this is exactly how 30% uh, of the referee reports read. <laughs> they say this is a work of such low intellectual insight that a child could have done it. And uh, so we had to fight back somehow. And this is something that economists and even most physicists never heard of uh, because they don't address these cross-correlation problems. They're much harder than correlations. OK, so it's, uh, are we doing on the time? Uh, almost time to stop. So let's go back, make a brief summary that the fat tails, as they're called, that fat means just not Gaussian. Uh, obey an inverse cubic law. This is a new result, and it seems to be universal for all countries of the world except one. That the fat tails of other quantities, like volatility and so forth, obey their own power laws, usually with different exponents, and that these exponents are interrelated a little like they are in physics, where Benjamin Widom introduced some relations that connect different exponents for a cooperative system near a critical point, suggesting that maybe what makes all these things happen is that all these firms, all these traders, are somehow interacting in a very complicated way. And we said that for the time correlation function, there's no memory, but 
for the volatility correlation function, there is a memory, and it's a very long memory, a power law decay. Uh, the random matrix theory I just said, and I didn't talk about what this means, <coughs> but roughly what it means we'll see in the coming slide or two. I have, Fabio, five more minutes? Yes. Is it okay? Yeah, you won't take it away, though. <laughs> 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 yeah, one man I'm not going to argue with today. <laughs> okay. So now, Tobias Price. Tobias Price is a very, very gifted young man. And he uh, uh, came to me out of the blue, literally, on Christmas vacation four years ago, five years ago. And he wrote me an email saying, I'd like to come over and uh, work with you or something, and I'm co co arriving on December 23rd. And I said, I, I said uh, to my family, uh, uh, someone wants to come over and work with me, and he's arriving December 23rd for two months. And so the, the quick answer is, well, tell him you'll see him on January 3rd. But I can't do that. It's not my nature. So, so I, I, I met this, this man, and he was remarkable. And he not only brought a good brain, but he brought data. <laughs> And you can imagine that, in, for me, data are the most exciting thing. Because we've already learned from our referees that you don't need much of a brain, but you do need data. And what the data he brought was, was every trade of one commodity, the DAX future, DAX is, is a German uh, average, and people gamble on it, just like S&P. You gamble whether they go up or down. And he had every trade that not only the price change, but the exact time in milliseconds when the trade occurred. And the gaps between trades for a popular thing like that are in the order of a few milliseconds. So what to do with all these data? I think there were 13 million of them now. And uh, this is just a pretty picture in the style of Mandelbrot to show that if we look at the fluctuations on a big time scale, I've forgotten what now, uh, uh, a day, they look like that, and when you look on the scale of an hour, they look similar, and so forth and so on. And this, by the way, is from a readable article. Most articles are not readable, but this is in a physics world, which is like Scientific American, only out of Britain. And uh, so what to do with these data? That was the problem. And, you know, you have, I mean, you could, so what do you do? First thing you do is plot them. So this is a plot. Uh, to be honest, this is a little schematic, but this is a plot of, of each transaction. The x-axis is not time, it's transactions. And each transaction is characterized first by a trading price. Obviously, if I'm going to sell something to you, we have to agree on how much you're going to pay. And, and the volume. So, if, for example, the price looks good, you might have a huge volume and sell by thousands of shares, and otherwise you might buy, buy very, very few ch shares. And both of these things are fluctuating. And the first thing you see with the eye, this is before any analysis, you see that there are these switching points where the price is going down and it changes its mind and starts to go up a little bit. And it goes down and up and down and up and down and up. These we like to call micro trends. They're very short, on the order of hundreds of milliseconds at most. And and the switching, we simply call switching. So this is micro-trend switching, very easy to understand term. And, uh, and the, anyone, even a high school student, can see that when a trend switch takes place, the volume jumps. And it jumps the same whether it switches from going down to going up, or here going up to going down. Here another one, here another one. So why is that? It's not, not, not completely clear. I mean, you know, answers to questions like why are always, you know, uh, full of imagination of the person who's answering. But, but it, it, it seemed like this might reflect the, the cooperative interaction of all the traders. And why is that? What makes this whole process work is that traders all over Germany, and actually all over the world, but mainly in places associated with Germany, are watching the computer screen, and they're guessing when the market's going to turn around and start going up. And what do they do? Why do they guess that? Because if they don't buy it at this bottom, if they delay, it'll be right where it was now. So and then they won't have any profit. And I think you know this, but maybe you don't. My son's a trader for Goldman Sachs. Uh, you, you, every day, your profit or loss is recorded publicly 
your boss sees it and your friends see it and you see it. So if you have a bad day, there's no problem. But if you have five bad days, uh, on Friday, you get a little knock at the door like this. And at the door is your friendly boss with a smile on his face and sticking out his hand. And right behind me is a policeman, just in case you go bananas and nuts and start to wreck the equipment. And, and they thank you for your hard work. And, and then you're on the street at 9 o'clock Friday morning. There's nothing to do for the rest of your life. <laughs> so this is a big shock. No one wants to go through that. So there's a huge tension to, uh, of all these traders to guess where the bottom is. And the reverse here, of course. If it's going up, if you sold it too soon, you won't make much profit. If you sell it too late, you won't make much profit. But if you sell it just right, you've made all that profit. And so by the end of the day, your boss will come in with a smile, but he'll shake your hand also. But there'll be no policeman, and, and because you're doing a good job. So we hypothesize that the mechanism of this volume is that near the switching points, everybody's got his or her hand on the trigger waiting to buy. And then, as, 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 so, ready, and some buy a little sooner, and some buy a little later. But the peak is usually right at the minimum. And similarly for selling. So this is what we have, that's all qualitative. Now let's make some analysis. How to analyze. Well, we know another switch in nature, which is a phase transition. And the most dramatic switch of all is the switches that occur in helium, which is just a gas, uh, when the system gets near its uh, transition to superfluidity. And at that time, measures of fluctuations rise incredibly and then come down afterwards, and rise incredibly and come down afterwards. And these are three different scales, degrees, milli-degrees, and micro-degrees, and the same function fits all of them. That means it has to be a power law. So let's look at this volume. We already saw the volume went up, right? So if we do a little bit of averaging, not cheating, but just looking at many f f uh, switches, uh, and then we get a nice smooth curve that, to my mind, looked just like this curve. And I think this may have been my only contribution to the project, <laughs> was to say, gee, that looks like a, a, a phase transition. In fact, it looks just like helium. So, so uh, if helium just stopped with this, this lambda shape, that's why it's called a lambda transition, if it just stopped here, that would be one thing. But the researchers in physics know better than just to stop with the picture. They analyzed these data and found a singularity, a functional form for that singularity. And so, so we can do the same thing. We can take those volume data and make the same kind of log-log plot, which I won't explain, uh, but it's a plot of the distance you are from the switching point, which is called epsilon minus one, as a, f a function of, uh, of this uh, volume, V star. And you see the, the data are approximately linear over a little more than a decade, 1.2 to 2.7, so one and a half decades. And a different slope on the two sides, one slope on this side, one slope on that side. And similarly for the trade time, so I won't go through it in detail, we don't do that. And so coming back to this idea that there's this cooperative interaction, Suppose we look now not just at the DAX, which had 14 million uh, data points, but at something that uh, extends, uh, so this only extended over about a year. But instead look at something extended over 40 years, 45 years, 47 years, which is the uh, S&P 500. Same idea, it's also like the DAX, some kind of average, but here we have data that go over 47 years. You can get them off the web, actually. And the same plots, let's see, this was the volume. Do you remember 0 0.15, 0 0.07? And here's the same plot, but now for 47 years worth of data. And the same straight lines, approximately the same slope, 0 0.15, 0 0.11. Not exactly, of course. I wouldn't believe it if it were. And then this is something else, the volatility, which we didn't talk about just now, but you see again the slopes are fairly similar, 42, 46. So it suggests that whatever this mechanism is, it operates at all time scales. So just as here, the fluctuations in helium work at all distances from the critical point, so also here. Good. So this is the final point to make. What is going on? So 
this plot, this graph, is something that Antonio Canelio helped me understand better than I did. And it, and it has direct applicability here, in my opinion, because in economics, there is something called the herd effect. And all the herd effect means is that like sheep or cattle or anything, traders uh, uh, tend to follow each other a little bit for a good reason. Because suppose you're making profit and I can see your every day your profit and loss is going up and your boss is smiling and there's no sign of policeman. And I don't want to have a policeman in my office, so what do I do? I, I copy you. I say, oh, what did you trade today? And yeah, okay, it's perfectly legal to copy. <clears throat> and so this is herd effect. And in, there are many, many examples. Like Enron is a famous one, where everybody did the same thing, and everyone knew it wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, but it was simply going up. You can't afford to pass up a bargain, even if it's based on nothing. And of course, sooner or later, it fell. It fell to zero very rapidly. So <clears throat> that's herd effect. And why, what makes the herd effect, though, is, well, I already explained it, you just follow somebody else. But if you want to make a little model of it, you do what we do in, in, uh, in phase transitions. You say that two traders, called Mary and Nancy, interact with each other, as I just said. I watch you because your profit and loss went up. But they also interact indirectly because if Mary's profit goes up, then a neighbor at the next desk sees Mary and copies a little bit, and the neighbor there sees that neighbor and copies, and finally Nancy sees that neighbor and copies. So it's a more indirect interaction. There are two interaction paths. And then here there is five uh, interaction paths, and there are many, many configurations. But the remarkable thing is the correlations along any path must decay exponentially. Why is that? Because like when you crack the whip and ice skates, you don't have ice here, never mind. Uh, <laughs> but if, if you do anything cooperatively in a chain, there is a decrease each time in the strength. And that's an exponential decay. So how would you ever get a power law then if everything each, along each of these paths is an exponential decay? And the answer is that the number of paths is growing, but also exponentially. You can even see it here, one, two, six. That's not enough to see an exponential, but you can do this by brute force as far as you want. And the number of different paths is growing exponentially. So if Mary makes profit, uh, uh, Nancy over here uh, uh, can learn about it in many, many, many ways. And the number of paths that Nancy learns with, with uh, five steps, so to speak, is more than three, is more than one, and that number is growing exponentially. So then you'd say, wait, then they should cancel out. There are two warring exponentials. The decay is going down, right? And the number of paths is going up, and they're both exponential, so they should cancel. But a miracle happens. This going up is not a pure power law. It's got a, a prefactor, which is weaker than an exponential, and that prefactor is a power law. So it's a purely geometric fact that the mechanism whereby we get these power laws in a, in a simple model, which we believe describes all the systems that I know about at least, uh, is a model in which the two worrying exponentials just cancel each other and what's left over is a power law. And that power law has to do with the multiplicity of, of uh, correlation paths between Mary and Nancy. So that's the herd effect. There's a second effect, easier to explain, called the, the news effect. Everyone knows from the newspaper that if the market, say, goes down, the, the critics always have a reason. They say, oh, Kennedy was shot or something, you know. And it was, uh, markets make big changes when there's news. And this is 100% true. They do make big changes. But it's not the only reason to change. You can have no news and still change. And uh, uh, so this news effect is just like an external magnetic field. It affects all the traders. Mary feels it. Nancy feels it. The, everyone feels it who opens their eyes. Of course, if you traded in a dungeon, and didn't know anything going on, like AIDA, uh, then you wouldn't know what's going on, and you wouldn't have this uh, uh, news effect. Of course, you wouldn't have herd effect either, except for Ramates, who's there. So um, it's a good place to stop, and just with a little teaser, that to understand these switchings, there's a brand new idea that's due to Sergei Bulderev, 
a graduate student in Israel, Parshani, Jerry Paul, and Shlomo Havlin, which is relatively recent, which has to do with coupled networks, which have the remarkable property. They can explain things like the blackout in Italy in September of 03, and they can, and how sudden it was, the cascade of failures, and how you can get a first order abrupt breakdown instead of the usual breakdown, which is second order. And I won't talk about that now, but some other time. So I want to close by thanking all of you for coming. I'm deeply, deeply touched. I didn't expect that. I asked Fabio who would come, and I, he, he wouldn't tell me, so I thought maybe his wife, Mahe, would come, and I was very pleased that she did come. But uh, I'm very touched that all of you come. I won't name you by name, except my publisher. He's very special. Good. So thank you for your attention, and thank you for this wonderful, wonderful uh, piece of paper, which for me symbolizes a very deep admiration for IMT Luca and my commitment that IMT Luca uh, become the number one place in Italy, if not in all of Europe, if not in all the world, to get a solid exposure to graduate level uh, education. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.